there is a certain uh, pleasure that comes along with having so much power over a person to end their life. You know, that's the ultimate. That's, you know, kind of a God complex when you can end somebody's life. When you're even doing it, it looks real. You know, it, it feels real. This is a real person's body that you're doing this to. And I think the thing that makes it even more um, eerie and, and, and a little bit difficult to do as not only an actress but as a person is that this really happened. <laughs> But I remember saying, you know, I'm sorry if you get hurt. I'm sorry if this is uncomfortable or bad for you. But this has to be real. I was not out to glorify or sensationalize. You know, this was a horrible, horrible thing. There's no justice at all in God's green world, you know, why these people should have suffered this home invasion and then be crippled and then murdered. It's, it's horrible and it's terrifying and if you lose focus of that, well then you've lost focus of why we talk about Charles Manson. Ah! Always trying to use it. Charlie. I can remember that the first scene, as I recall, was my first scene with Pittman, Mark Pittman, as being like my introduction to the movie, kind of, sort of, so to speak. <laughs> that was the Beanfield sex scene. Come on, Tex, why else would you and I be here right now? Why would any of us be here? The story is, we were talking about this for weeks in advance. And we were like, yeah, yeah, we, let's just get naked. Let's just do this stuff naked. It's going to be great. It's going to be liberating. And it was kind of like, Leslie, Mark, Mark, Leslie, okay, follow me to this bean field and let's disrobe and we're going to do this thing. And it's like early in the morning and um, had the potential to be really uncomfortable. I was, I was very, very young and kind of insecure like a lot of people are about their body. And Jim goes, you know... I want to get naked too. I want to direct this whole scene naked just to support you. So Jim directs naked, the first shot we ever do, and it's like this huge sex scene in the middle of this bean fields, and that was it. And that pretty much was the way it went from then on. Did you have any idea you were going to be one of the apostles? It was really surprising how comfortable it was from that point on. And you got to be ready for that right now, right here, right now, just like that. And that's where we're at all the time. In 1983, I got a scholarship to Wright State University to the motion picture program. You know, Wright State taught us technique, it taught us drive, it taught us competitiveness. And uh, Mike King was the equipment monitor, which was very, very important because um, he had the right to deny or give equipment. I had heard about Jim and that he was uh, a kid from Greenville who made eight millimeter movies. You know, he did basically his own versions of James Bond movies, uh, Dawn of the Dead. Uh, Sinbad. Some of those movies did stop motion. Jim had already come in with at least six Super 8 movies that he'd done when he was a kid. And they were, they were absolutely incredible. I had this guy, man, he's just, there's nothing stopping him. So he set the tone immediately with all these crazy movies. There were a lot of students at Wright State. Jim and Mike were like the one group of people who actually went out and made movies. A lot of people talked about movies, but Jim and Mike actually went and did it. We all wanted to make films commercially. Myself, Marcella Gomez, and Mike King. And we all had different ideas about how to go about it. We incorporated ourselves as Asmodeus Productions. But about in 85, Jim talked about wanting to do a 40, 30, 40 minute just action highlights reel where he wanted to show his stuff off, what he could do with martial arts and fast editing and he was looking for somebody to help produce it. He knew I had the key to the equipment room. 
And by then we were pretty good friends, so we were all down for it. And uh, that's when we started working on Deadbeat at Dawn. I took out a, a bank loan saying that I was going to complete a third year of college at Wright State. Instead, I bought 10 rolls of VNF 72 reversal, and we jumped into it. We took it to New York, and then we took it to Alexander Beck. He was going to represent it, and he, was, he came back to us with um, eight contracts. And uh, we added that together, and it was well over $100,000 to start with. I mean, we were ecstatic. That's one of the reasons we had decided to go ahead and buy this small studio with money we really didn't have. Jim and Mike and Marcello bought a little studio, a commercial studio, in Centerville. My role was support. I was, I was studying for a business degree, and we all had these dreams that this would be a big financial success and that this would be the tool to use um, for new projects. And, you know, to make a long story short, eventually all those contracts, 80, 90 percent of them turned to crap. <laughs> Never happened. Not one. Not one contract. <laughs> During our halcyon year of 1988, where things were very good, we were finishing Deadbeat of Dawn. We had made the trailer for Roadkill, The Last Days of John Martin. We were convinced that we were an unstoppable force of independent filmmaking. And so Mike, righteously so, said, let's just jump into our next film. Jim, of course, when he jumped into it, just, let's just do it, worry about the important things later, such as the financing of the film. Charlie, this is Tex. You can have anything I got. Well, me and Mike King had seen Geraldo Rivera's special. It was a two-hour special, aired in early 1988. It was called Murder America. The, the thing that kept you from commercial to commercial was this carefully divvied out interview with Charles Manson. And both me and Mike were flabbergasted at Geraldo's blazing rating grab and how well that Charles Manson came off. And Mike said, let's make a film about Charles Manson. Originally it was going to be called Cult Killers. It was like, okay, we've got a set amount of money, let's get the movie done and get it out there and hopefully make some money off of it. What do you think, Mike? But it was definitely going to be a very quick exploitation thing. I am so sorry. <laughs> when Mike suggested that we do it in two weeks, I agreed like a fool, and I called Mark Gillespie, uh, an actor, writer, friend of mine. And he came up with a horrible script. Terrible. But one thing it did have was the structure of the interviews of the incarcerated defendants telling the story. I threw his script out entirely, but I kept that structure. To me, it seemed just the perfect way to go about this film. The research I started to go after hot and heavy, and the more that I read, the more complex it became. And I realized that this was no easy you know, exploitation film. I really had to try to do some justice to the truth. We're waiting for our father to be set free. He's a genius. You don't realize. I made a conscious decision from the get-go not to contact any of the incarcerated defendants. Primarily because I had done enough research at that point that I saw the wildly divergent accounts and I knew that they were making their history up as they went along and they routinely whitewashed their own involvement and I knew that I could not trust any one of them to give me the truth. Beyond that, the last thing that I wanted to do was to try and make friends with any of these cold-hearted killers. I have no respect for somebody who takes a human life, and the last thing I want to do is be a pen pal 
you know. Jim would tell me, Tex did this, Tex did that. You know, Tex was in, this is who Tex was. He was this kid from wherever, and he just sort of hooked up with these uh, crazy hippies. What, I, didn't, I did no research at all. I had always been interested in Manson. I'm a big, huge, true crime buff. And there isn't a lot known about the Patty character anyways. Jim asked me to play the role of Sadie, so I, I read up everything I could about her. I still remember this one picture of her uh, in jail, you know, and she's like, my smile is because of Jesus. And you know, you know, it's such a crack. All these people kill people and commit all these heinous crimes and then they go to jail and they become Christians and they think all of a sudden, oh, well, you know, I'm okay now. Everything that I did in the past doesn't matter because Jesus forgave me. What's in the bag, sunshine? Hi, Sadie. Since we couldn't pay most of the people, we had to find people that were into it and willing to work for free and go for it for the long haul. Some were referred, but most of the people, they were people we knew from Wright State University. I was very honest. I said, what I'm going to do is probably make the freakiest movie that I'll ever make because this is the content, this is the subject matter. Out of respect of history, we're going to do it NC-17. We're not going to screw around. <laughs> because I needed people that could be with it, who would make you believe, you know? I didn't need um, some, you know, neophyte trying to uh, bamboozle my vision with their own political correctness. And I was going, who's gonna be Charles Manson? And I think I looked at Mike, and he looked at me, and we looked over, and six feet away, Marcella was staring at the TV screen, watching something, and, you know, <laughs> you, we kind of felt evil, but, we, you know, we knew, we knew at that point that we had to, you know. And it took some convincing. It did. Marcella was not um, immediately uh, hip to the idea. You know, he felt righteously so exploited because of um, the way he looked at that time. He was growing his hair long. So, you know, I mean, two and two add four, right? Better watch what you're saying, Shorty. <laughs> or I'm gonna have your head in a box. For that first uh, four months in 1988, in the fall of 1988, I was writing right up until the moment we shot. There was a script, for sure. There wasn't really a script that I saw. I would get pages of lines and things and action and, and stuff like that. I want to say, and I could be wrong, so there, was, there was maybe like 50, 60 page script treatment kind of thing. <laughs> I knew that if I screwed up making this look like, you know, Ohio rather than California, I'd be sunk. So that was a chief thing of mine is to make it sell as California, because if I failed there, the whole movie would fail. Marcello's father had a farm. A bunch of us went up there with the idea that in the span of like two long weekends, they'd shoot the entire movie. And you wonder if the whole movie, what's the correlation between Manson having the family on the Spawn Ranch in 69 and Jim dragging a bunch of people to a farm in Youngstown you know. We shot a lot of footage and uh, it just really set the standard for the whole movie. I mean, it was just a big party. It really was. We had the crew, we had all the actors, we had strippers come in from Cincinnati to play extras, you know, we, they were going to get naked and all that stuff. And it was like the best time ever. You know, most shoots, you have a party after the shoot. No, we had a party before the shoot, during the shoot, after the shoot. It was always a big plastic trash can filled with ice and beer. And I can remember going in and digging all the way through that thing and, and just wanting to find a, a, you know, a Coke, a Pepsi, something other than beer. Uh, and there never was. There, we smoked a lot of marijuana during the filming of that. 
and I rolled uh, both real and placebo joints. Jim would knock on the door, and then I'd have to row more. I need to get high. Pack <laughs> me a bowl. I think it loosened me up, because I'm kind of, I'm not an actor, really, you know? So uh, going back to the Manson family idea and getting into the whole mindset of this is all 60s and uh, free love and, uh, you know, partying, that's what it all was. So the beer, the alcohol, the drugs, and all that stuff was part of it. You know, I wasn't a dictator. I was a populist. You know, I said, I'm just, you know, part of this experiment, just like you. And I think that made people feel very easy. We had always rehearsed every scene, um, so people had the comfortability of knowing what they're doing. I never sprang any surprises on anybody. And if, you know, if somebody wanted to have a few drinks before a take, I'd encourage him. I have to mention that Jim always paid attention to the business at hand first and did not let partying get in his way. It was, we are here to shoot a film, to, you know, get whatever done that we need to get done. Then people would relax and fool around and party but he was always very much on top of what was going on. I ended up being director, uh, psychiatrist, um, big brother, you know, whatever it took. My energy at that point in my life was almost limitless. So I'd go, you know, two hours of sleep if I had to hold somebody's hand, if I had to talk to somebody, you know, whatever it took, you know. So. They believed in it, and I made sure they believed in it because I wouldn't have it any other way. Charlie does things his way. He don't conform to the pig rules of the establishment. I saw Jim's vision really from the beginning. I really did. I trusted him completely. I don't know why, to be honest with you. I don't know why I trusted him so much. Jim always made everyone feel very much at ease, um, regardless of what they were doing. Uh, and he definitely made everyone feel that they were just as important a part of the process as anyone else. He knew what we could do, and uh, he would just say, hey, you look, Pitt, you know, I need you to do this. And we could just pull it off. If we were off track any, he would tell us. He would say, no, 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 like this. And he would do the, he would do the whole thing himself. And you go, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying. Jim was somebody that amazed me at his ability to focus on a million things at once and make every single person, every single person feel like they were important, every single person. He would run from person to person and say, okay, you're doing this, are you okay with that? You're, here's where you're gonna be, are you okay? Are you okay, are you okay? And everybody had to be comfortable. It was important to him that everybody was always comfortable with what they were doing. You know, he made it feel like no holds barred, people. Let's just do this thing. Until you can give yourself completely and your ego's dead, you can't be at the now. Jim's the puppet master. You know, he'd be like, okay, now, don't be real witchy, girls. You know, he'd just kind of give us these little, okay, now. And he would actually, you know, model how he wanted us to do the lines, like, like hey, you know, he had a little crackle on the end. And, you know, he was, Jim is really great at just pulling things out of people. I am going to get some medical supplies right now. You do what I say, say. Fuck you. I consciously recreated uh, the filmmaking techniques of that period, I mean, heavy use of a wide angle lens. Um, editing styles, they recall Easy Rider or performance. I mean, I'm really going overboard to invoke these little subconscious things that we've grown up with, if you have grown up through that era and seen media of that era, films of that era. I don't remember exactly when my mind crossed over from reality to imagination, but there was no escaping it. I made a conscious effort to um, recreate a segment from Macbeth by Rome Polanski, which happens during the fear chair sequence. When he said death is beautiful, he meant it. Death is beautiful because it's what people fear the most. Because we were a self-financed sort of unit at some points, I had a license to experiment with different director's styles. And for some sequences, I wanted to be Orson Welles. 
And for other sequences, I thought it was more appropriate to be Dennis Hopper during the last movie. You know, I had freedom. I had real freedom on this film. <laughs> One of the best lines Jim ever ever gave me was, was pain is temporary, film is forever. And I think that carries through with everything that, that Jim did when his films. When it came to the film, whatever you sacrificed was worth it. He was our fearless leader. He totally inspired us. It's like, you know, I would never ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do. It's like, but you do anything. I almost burnt my arm off. He slapped me around a bunch. I, I bled my own blood for this movie. Kevin Curran shot himself in the face with a blank. But, hey, it was fun. <laughs> There's this one scene, and you know, it's beautiful when you see it in the movies. You know, it's like, oh, out in the woods, and a nice little waterfall. But the waterfall was really the runoff from some kind of power plant or paint factory or something like that. And of course we didn't have permission to be there. So we're all, you know, looking around saying, okay, quick, take off your clothes, all right? You know, film the scene and wondering if you'd be growing another toe at some point or something like that. Was all the hair gonna fall out after this scene? But hey, it looked good on camera, so it was all worth it. You have to have a real love in your heart to do this for people. Get Relax. Heavy, Bobby. I'm, I'm getting really okay. dressed. It was actually great having him actually in the film. Um, that really helped because even if he wasn't in the um, in the scene or in the shot, you know, he he was always such a part of the movie and of the actors and of the of the film just from you know actually bit playing a part in it. So you always sort of felt like he was with you. Let it go. Let it go where it wants. Let it go. Let it go where it wants. Let it go. Let it go. As far as you go on cinema, everybody has bypassed Bobby Beausoleil and the fact that he was a linchpin of this whole story. No! And I, I looked at Bobby and he kind of had the same physical build and brown hair and I said, I'm gonna play him. I had a lot of anxiety over getting busted. Vince Bugliosi has an agenda, of course. You know, because he was the prosecuting attorney of the case. And he has turned that into a cottage industry. Um, I'm glad he was the prosecutor because he was able to convict Manson, rightly so, but on very flimsy circumstantial evidence. This had nothing to do with the race war. No no blacks against whites, no Armageddon, it, it, no white owl, no Helter Skelter. That wasn't what it was about. My film, in part, was a reaction to his, um, you know, argument to the jury. His argument basically was that Charlie was trying to incite a race war and took his ideas from the White Out. Well, uh, you know, I know that Charlie talked about both those ideas, like he talked about a lot of other crazy drug ideas, but that wasn't the focus. The focus was to get Bobby Bosley out of jail. Well, for a guy like this to murder for another man, boy, there had to be some witchery going on. Well, I knew that they had killed dogs, and uh, I decided we had to represent that. And the dog, Cruce Flood. <laughs> it's the crucifixion knife, dog blood, dance orgy sequence. Uh, the, the family dog blood orgy. The dog blood acid orgy crucifixion scene. Dog blood crucifixion orgy sequence. Uh, crucifixion dog blood orgy. The scene's supposed to take place on a beach, but we shot in a field. So I instructed Mike, you know, um, just cross slide it with two 10Ks, throw up red gel so it looks like hell, and we'll go for it. It was a really grueling shoot. This was like a recently plowed, some kind of cane field of some sort where there were stalks of something similar to bamboo that had shards that were like literally ripping into our feet. I can remember some trepidation with Marcelo. 
you know, and kind of looking in his eyes and seeing, is he okay with all this? And hoping he was because we so needed him to be. We all had to feel what it would feel like to take acid and drink dog blood and have an orgy and worship Charlie as if he was Christ. Tom Burns, who played Clem, had a little extra grooviness for the cast to um, embody themselves in their roles. So there were always, you know, for the people who really wanted to do that kind of method acting, that was available for them. I think people were, like, looking forward to it or dreading it. You know, but when time came to shed your clothes and crucify Marcello, we did it. Uh, there's like the whole Manson family, as it was at that point, uh, running around naked, guys and girls. There was simulated sex going on all the time, and I'm running around naked, directing, you know. Um, and I remember, you know, certain cast members would drift off into the darkness and you would hear them, you know, having sex. And everybody, you know, just, well, this is what we're doing. They had all these strippers that, you know, all these strippers to add to the naked bodies covered in blood running around on acid. But uh, there was actually, I think uh, Tom Burns really did have, like, oral sex with one of these girls. and. I, uh, you know, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't, you know, point him out, but whatever. It's a documentary, right? Let the truth be known. It felt frenetic. We felt there. We felt like we were in that moment. I can remember just standing back between takes and just looking at this scene before me and thinking, what the fuck is this? What is this shit? You know, is this real? I know Jim had this little me and Leslie thing going on. He's like, okay, now I'll bring that over. And so there was this one scene where he does like the extreme close up of, of my nipple, you know, and he's like, okay, Leslie, now I want you to lick that. Jim is making blood out of Cairo syrup and food coloring, right? So once it gets all over you, you know, you're just a sticky mess. Mark Pittman and I are naked covered in, in maple syrup blood, and we're laying right beside a bonfire, and when we got up to actually disembark, we were connected by our pubic hairs. I mean connected. And actually, Jim had to come by and pour water on us to get us unconnected, because when we first stood up, it was like, ah! The dog's fine. It was another couple of weekends after that that we went back up there and shot more stuff. And I think, you know what, about that time is whenever we realized there ain't no way in hell we can pull this off this way. <laughs> it's going to take longer. We, 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 we developed this camaraderie as a cast between us. And, you know, we had weekends. We had four-day weekends of shooting nonstop. Um, a lot of people came in and were like kind of like freaked out by the whole scene. But the core group of us um, really we were like a big family anyway, you know? We were the family making the family, right? We were Charlie's family, and every time we got together, it was a family reunion. We were the Manson family getting together to have a good time. Help! Save me! Save me! The lead characters, they would follow Jim into hell, as would I. So, you know, whatever, I mean, we'd be like, uh, okay. You know, he'd come up with some wild, crazy, insane idea of how we were going to accomplish this, and we just went and we did it. I would have done anything for this movie, quite honestly. Anything. Anything he asked me to do, I would have done it. If you love him like a brother like I do, you know, he calls, you drop everything, and uh, you just do it. My wife would get so mad at me because uh, uh, I'd say, we can't go anywhere because I have all this stuff to do. Um, and Jim would call and, hey, man, I need you to, and I'd be out the door. It was a little bit like uh, Manson's fam family in real life in that way. I mean, you know, they had a magnetic leader and these people that came together and, you know, they came together for a reason, but... What I vividly remember uh, in terms of fear was I could not tell whether these people were really Manson worshipers or they were making a film about Manson. 
And that level of anxiety and that level of fear, actually, I kind of used. Kill me. My life in exchange for my brother. Shoot me. Amen, Charlie. Somebody made an off-the-cuff statement about, oh, maybe we'll go out and sacrifice a dog. I'm going, oh, oh. And, you know, and I didn't know how to take that. It was like, oh, uh, are we making, what are we doing here? It was just, it was, it was kind of scary. I would be in character all the time when we were on set. I remember Maureen and I were sitting, waiting, kind of waiting for Jim and Mike to, to get their lighting straightened out and, and, and work out their shots. And Maureen and I were kind of just sitting under a tree with our retractable knives. We were stabbing them into the ground and kind of just, we were totally in character. I remember Nate coming by thinking, I'll go smoke a joint with the girls. And he comes by, and I remember him like crouching down. We were like kind of under a tree. And I remember him crouching down all happy-go-lucky, Nate. And he's like, hey, girls. Whoa. Whoa. And he like, like was scared. Scared of us. And we wouldn't break character. You got him. When we killed Shorty, I tell you, Nate was the biggest pain in the ass, all right? We had all endured so much in this film. And he was like, towel, you know, he was like such a pussy. He whined so much and all the rest of us just endured everything. And by the time we killed Shorty, we were ready to kill him. We cut him into nine pieces and buried him in nine places. And I would have to make an effort when I would wind down 10 hours after a shoot or two days later, I would have to make an effort to be like, this isn't who I am, I swear. I swear to God, it's not who I am. I'm a nice person, I'm a deadhead. You know, I mean, love me, love me. But they were like, no, oh, you're too scary. You're just too weird, you're too out there. I mean, you like seem like you like this, you're getting off on it. And I'm like, score. <laughs> it's all true, Tex. I know about these things, I know it's all true. What we shot, in 88, um, that initial burst was um, probably what is now 50% of the film. We got as far as uh, the Hinman murders, actually, and we ran out of money at that point. It was tough. I mean, it was a constant struggle after that point to get money, and we only got would get small infusions of money here or there. Then it became the process of we've got a few hundred dollars, I want to shoot some more scenes. You know, we had to find some small-time investors, people who would give us just enough money to, to shoot some stuff and pay some of our overhead. And uh, that's the bane of this entire thing, you know, is starting without your budget in place. That's why it took so fucking long, you know? This is all your fault, Charlie! Shut up! Marcella was starting to re-examine um, some aspects of his life and what he really wanted to do. And I was growing further and further away from being involved. Marcel and Rob just realized that they didn't want to put up with this, you know. They wanted to grow up and be adults. And being, you know, a low-budget independent filmmaker, you pretty much behave like a kid a lot of the times. Me and Mike knew that we were embracing something that took real stamina. And these guys didn't want any part of it. I mean, they, you know, it was fun while it seemed like it had promise for them. Marcelo left for his own reasons. Um, you know, that's very difficult to talk about. That's his, that's his personal business. I think he had boundaries philosophically in himself that just prevented him from being able to embrace this. Marcelo moved out of state. I believe he moved to Colorado at that point. I hear that the actor who played um, Charlie died of mysterious circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> He's somewhere in the desert. <laughs> I don't know where he is. His body's chopped up in pieces. By the time Marcello left the film, thankfully, I had accomplished, you know, pretty much what I was after. The film uh, was originally conceived to, f 
to focus in on the family and not on Charles Manson himself. Jim was adamant that this film portray the actual killers. There's a moment in the film where Carl Day says, Every time they even make a mention of the murders, the family murders, it is Charlie, 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 the, the prince of evil, right? Very seldom have I ever seen them mention the kids that put the knives and the bullets in the victims. That's what gets me. And so the loss of Marcelo Gomez was not that crippling a loss because in the end, they had precisely what they needed. So these are our you know, blood bullet hits for tomorrow. Uh, these are just basically to create the, the splatter of blood upon impact uh, to give the illusion of the actor being shot. Don't look at Jamie. Concentrate on something and run towards that. Roll camera. Then I got invited to um, a film festival in Northampton, England. Nothing shot. And I showed Deadbeat and Dawn, and I showed a 15-minute preview of Charlie's Family. And the response was so extraordinary that I came back on fire. And I told Mike that we have to make something new. You know, we can't just keep trying to raise money for Charlie's Family. We've got to make something new and a short so that we can show people how we've grown as filmmakers. Satan approves. Um, he wanted me to do the costumes and wardrobe for my sweet Satan and some of the beauty makeups for the girls. And um, I modeled him, his entire character, I modeled after um, Jamie Holiday. Now those kids, that was a whole new trip for me. This was a whole new generation. They were tattooed and pierced and doing heroin and living way more extraordinarily than I had in my freest days. The reason that they wanted to participate in my film was that they knew that I was making a film about Charles Manson. So a light bulb went off and I said, these two things go together. Basically said, have some new ideas for it, freshen it up. Here's the, through the storyline, modern day Manson kids, and I want you to be sort of the, the ringleader of this you know, group of degenerates, and I think you're perfect for it. And I said, you might be right. Martin Luther King died with love. He described uh, my role as being a drugged out teenager in a big city, I guess it was supposed to be LA, new age Mansonite group who would do drugs and have orgies and end up eventually, you know, killing people. I had some experience having known some people who were really into crack <laughs> with, uh, with how, how the mannerisms, how the smoking of the, of the crack would go. I taught everybody how to smoke crack properly that day. No way I was fine with, uh, you know, doing, you know, some drugs uh, anytime, you know. And he was very intent on supplying some sort of drug to put in this syringe so that I would actually be doing a drug. Um, heroin was the drug I was supposed to be doing, insisting that there actually be drugs in the syringe. He s gave me cocaine in the spoon. And so when it came time to pretend to be passing out and um, feeling the effects of heroin, my heart was beating twice as fast. And then he would just like, you know, surprise you and behind the camera he'd be like hopping up and down, like making funny faces and having horns, you know, to, because you're supposed to be laughing or struggling somehow. <laughs> I decided that the um, new cult of Charlie's kids had to kill my fictional TV reporter, Jack Wilson. And I based that on the murder of Lawrence Merrick, the producer of the Academy Award-nominated documentary Manson.
directed by Robert Hendrickson. In 1977, Lawrence Merrick was shot in the head. The day before they found his body at his actor's studio, reports from my witnesses said that a guy in a yellow cap had shown up wanting to talk to Lawrence Merrick and he wanted to talk to him about Helter Skelter. I decided that this was not somebody actually connected with the Manson family, but this was some young kid who had taken heart because he was disenfranchised into their case and decided to pick up Charlie's flag on his own and commit stupidity. So I represented. What the fuck? In the original script, the Jack Wilson character in the modern day interviews was always intended to be in there to hold the, the sort of structure of it together. It was the young kids and ultimately their murdering of him that, that came later. And we, being the modern version and being into Manson and all this drug addled, wing nut, crime doing bad guys, are uh, not pleased with him putting any negative light potential negative light on Manson and the followers and the family. So he got to go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Jack Wilson's character was played by a local anchorman named Carl Day, who, those of us living in Dayton and growing up in Dayton, had seen this guy, and he's, he's a freaking anchorman on one of the local, on the, one of the big three network nightly news. One week from tonight, join me, Jack Wilson. For this particular role was one that I had really been doing on an everyday basis anyway, so it was sort of a natural. Technically, I knew what we were doing. I was a little concerned about the level of nudity and violence. It, I guess it's the old thing of being in television. This will never pass the censors. But then I've got to realize this was not geared for television. I was shocked to know that he would even have done this film. So when I found out, and it was almost and it was almost as if Jim sort of dangled this carrot like, but wait, your character, you're gonna get to shoot Carl Day. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently on the set, uh, I had actually scared him a little from what I'd been told. That was the night I had been drinking and taking the, the, the trucker speed. A couple of things concerned me about that. Number one, it was being shot. Wait a minute! You know, even though they say, well, it's a blank, I know of accidents where blanks don't quite go the way they were supposed to. He w checked two, three times, wanted to make sure that this was a blank, there weren't any live rounds in the room. <laughs> when I knew that he was nervous about it, we definitely used that to our advantage. <laughs> I, I remember almost throwing up on him as a result of all that. How about the stabbing? Well, we're going to cover that with a plate. And I figured a plate, you know, an armor about that thick. Well, it wasn't at all. It was about a pie plate thick. And it was pretty much a real blade, as I remember, not a retractable. That gave me a little bit of concern. We have to have a alert on our security. I was guaranteed by, uh, by our director that I'd be fine. So you got to trust your director. When I saw that new footage, I was like, what the hell is this? What is this crap? What has this got to do with anything? And he said, trust me, trust me. It's gonna tie it together. It's gonna make it appeal to more people. It's gonna show people that this shit still happens, that there's psychos like this out there. I really like the direction Jim took with it, with the kids, you know, even kids today, out, you know, they're looking for something. You know, there are kids who don't feel like they belong and they, they, they don't feel like they're part of this society. And I didn't buy it. I said, Jim, you're, you fucked up. The inclusion of the 1996 new cult of Charlie's Children to me is absolutely essential to this film working for me because otherwise it would be a straight docudrama of things in the past and you could dismiss it. You could put it behind you go, oh, those crazy late 60s look what happened then that's not now but no that does bleed into now if you think that the influence isn't there well then you're misreading society what the fuck is that supposed to mean charlie doesn't sir 
To me, one of the worst things about this entire case is not that it happened, well, which is horrible, but look what the media has done to America with it. They won't let it go. They need a ratings grab. They need to sell numbers. So they dust off Charles Manson and they flock to him. We wanted to bring out that Charlie was a, a, an icon, a symbol that had very little to do with a man, that it had become this sort of icon that, that meant something to these kids. I mean, at the end of the day, people are still talking about Manson. Manson's, Manson t-shirts are still being worn. They do collect his, his uh, records from prison, and some of them are less intellectually endowed than others, and they begin to have some sort of uh, worshipping <laughs> feelings for Charles Manson. Next week on Crime Scene, we're going to bring you face to face with the evil feud that forever poisoned the love generation. At the end of the day, I'm no better or worse than Jack Wilson or anybody else who's going to exploit this case. The only way that I can justify it within my own self, within my own heart, is I tried to tell the truth. That's my only out, because otherwise I'm selling murder, just like every prosecutor, tabloid reporter, paparazzi. Oh, and uh, I'm guilty of that, and uh, I made that, I admitted it on film. You can make more bogus books and movies about his life. You can joke about him. You can pretend to be him. You can say and do anything you want. But the truth is, you don't have the soul to face him. That's why I'm not too fucking keen to uh, revisit this type of material anytime soon. I want to move into fiction. I'm a filmmaker, man. I'm not part of the Manson family. and I'm not part of you know, your head trip or fucking anybody's head trip. I'm just a, I'm a filmmaker, I'm an artist. Because it's been piecemeal financing all the way through. And I've taken a vow to myself that I won't start another feature film unless all the money's in place. To be honest with you, because it just, was it ever gonna end? I didn't know. When was Jim gonna have a new idea or a new direction? Were we gonna shoot more stuff for new ideas? I don't know. <laughs> As time moved along, it was frustrating because the movie wasn't getting finished and stuff. And then it just became a matter of like, emotionally saying, okay, patience. The vision is still there, but we need patience. I mean, it was maddening for Jim especially because he was basically in limbo in between shoots. And then there were times when, you know, we would go for a while and we would have, you know, be shooting right along for a bit and then funds would run out again and we would just wait. I had gone through like three different lifetimes in the time of this film was being shot. When it started out, I was a, you know, I was a college student. I, I got married, I had a child, I got divorced, I was put on active duty during the Gulf War. Uh, you know, just all these crazy things had happened. I was a ballroom dance instructor and, and finally a school teacher. So, you know, uh, I, uh, so many things changed in my own personal life and yet I was Sadie the whole time. Now, obviously, I grew up on this film. I'll be able to someday look back and be the girl with the perfect 19-year-old breasts, and I'm like, you know, where'd those go? Oh, there they are. <laughs> oh, great, they're immortalized. And to get a phone call after so many years of, not, of leaving this behind as, you know, it being a fond memory and then finding out that we're filming again, it's like, woohoo, you know, Manson family reunion, you know, when do we start? The stuff in the church, the interviews, the old age stuff, you know, um, that stuff happened literally years later, you know? Then I went up to the house, I slid a screen, climbed in. Jim wasn't able to get exactly the footage that he needed to tell a complete story. He had moments, but he had very little interconnected tissue. So the modern day interviews would solve all of that. But they would also bring into it this Rashomon-like uh, thing where you could have different people telling different versions of different stories. The thing is that people refuse to understand is that Charlie wasn't looking for attention, which is why he got so much of it. Cut. That was pretty good.
good. Uh, Jim was there. He was actually the one interviewing, um, doing the interview. So, you know, it was it was a similar situation to this where he would sit and ask questions and basically we needed to respond as we thought our, our character would. It's my proudest moment on film where I have the snot running down my nose and, <laughs> you know, that was, um, that was not scripted. It was not something that we rehearsed. It was something that actually happened. <laughs> I just want to get out of here so I can make something good with my life. I couldn't remember the characters in the movie and Jim's like going, it's Patty, it's blah, 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 it's this person. I'm like, dude, you know, you've lived with this for the last 10 years. I haven't. I gave it up when we stopped shooting, so don't expect me to remember this stuff. So he would basically feed me lines, and I would go, okay, okay, it's starting to come back a little bit more. He just turned his head around. See, he had been validating everything that he was preaching, that the blacks would start an all-out race war. And I fucked up again. Dailies? This is funny. Get this. Dailies? Try Yearlies? Can we say bi yearlies? This is the kind of things that would send most filmmakers, I think, into cardiac arrest. You had to sit with something you shot eight months ago, and every time you open the refrigerator to get a hot dog, there's your film. And it's looking right at you and it's saying, it's screaming, please process me. And you've got to look at it in all good faith and say, no, I can't do that today. Your day will come tomorrow. I think there was a lot of us, myself included, that maybe saw Charlie's family as like a stepping stone to a career in acting and directing and writing and whatever. I'm sure there's a, a little bit of frustration, a little bit of disappointment there um, because that didn't happen. I've never been nervous about r money running out. I've lived my entire life, well, at least my life, as soon as I declared myself an independent filmmaker, almost like a vow of poverty. It's, um, I'm willing to go the distance. So I really don't question that. I just think about how can we get the rest of the money. I know he'll probably see this at some point, and I will say to say this, to Jim's face, I was all gun ho yay, Charlie's family, but at that point, um, I, I can remember feeling distinctly that I, I, you know, just drop it, let it go, go on to the next thing, Jim, go on to the next thing, just forget it. I did work at Wendy's for a while. I worked at a carryout, you know. Um, I did whatever I could to put money into the studio to keep that thing afloat. One time I was sitting on the couch at a friend's house and uh, Jim comes busting through the back door with this white button up shirt on and it's this got these brown thin stripes going up it and, and it's all unbuttoned and the sleeves are all unbuttoned and there's this big blood stain, you know, fresh wet blood right there. And, uh, and he's just like, I just got back from the blood bank. He pulled the blood out of his veins to pay for this money. I mean, literally donated plasma, like, to, to, to make money. To, I mean, he did this, like, I don't know what it is. I think he can do three times a week. He did this for years to finance this movie. Well, some days you eat, some days you make rent, you know? And sometimes you gotta choose. Finally, we couldn't make rent. We lost the studio in 94. You can always look in hindsight, hey, if we would have finished the thing and got it out in a year and made some money and went on to something else, you know, maybe we'd be working on our 10th movie now. <laughs> I really didn't believe wholeheartedly that the film would ever get done. If there was ever a thought that the movie wouldn't get finished, it probably has something to do with Jim just, like, being crazy. Like, you know, will Jim die before he finishes the movie? I never lost faith that this film would get finished and finished the right way. Tonight is the death walk of Abigail Folger. The murder sequences were the very last thing to be shot. We had held out on shooting the Tate LaBianca murders for a long time because we really wanted to shoot at least the Tate murders on a set. 
have flying walls because we really wanted to show off our camera work. The way that I had conceived of the actual Tate LaBianca murders, I knew that the film would live or die upon their representation. And because it was a real case and because I felt a moral responsibility to put the audience there, make them horrified, I wanted them to be the best that they could. And that sounds bizarre, I'm sure, to some people, you know, the best murders, but that's what I was trying to do. And the way that I saw them was an extended one takes, um, a la Orson Welles and Touch of Evil. I'm scared. And then came the call from Maureen, and she was pregnant. And she said, Jim, you shoot this or you don't get it. All right, fine. And so I had to do the way they are, which is cuts. You know, it's very cutting now. And um, now watching the film, I don't think that that's so bad. It's not the way that I had envisioned it, but I think it works. You know, God bless Maureen. There she was, six months pregnant, rolling around with Charlie Getz, you know, stabbing him with a retractable knife. And uh, it was because of her saying, I'm pregnant, you gotta shoot, I raised the money like in record time. You know, sometimes when somebody puts a gun to your head, you know, you jump. <laughs> and maybe sometimes that's a good thing. Okay, stand by, here we go. And half speed, action! As far as the level of violence, we knew we were gonna take it to the edge. I think you do a disservice uh, to tell a story like this without depicting the violence in a way that is truly disturbing. And I don't care how many, you know, zombie slasher sort of films you've seen, there's a tone to this violence that really, you know, gets you. Jim and I did do a certain amount of research into these killings to try to be as accurate as possible for what we were going to show. We sat down and watched uh, Nick Bogus's, uh, I don't know if you can call it a documentary, you know, Mondo flick called Death Scenes 2 where they had the actual crime scene photographs. You've got a mulligan stew of accounts. But the one that I ended up trusting out of the research was Tex Watson. Tex Watson, who is prison deacon in a men's correctional facility in San Luis Obispo, he seemed to remember everything, right down to how the hair in his nostrils felt. I mean, it's a weird shit. So I trusted him, and I decided to portray his version. At least I won't say anything! I took it right from the text, you know? Um, when somebody says, you know, the, the xiphoid process, I got a hold of a medical journal, and I looked up the freaking xiphoid process. It's like right here. So I made sure the knife went right here. You know, I mean, I just did what they said they did. Jim was really not his, he wasn't the happy, boisterous, raw energy Jim. He was the subdued, this is very serious. What we're about to shoot is an ugly, horrible, hideous thing. It is freaking horrible. Nobody has the right to invade your home. There's a reason, you know, that they're locked up. He'd be like, don't take this the wrong way, but to get this right, I'm gonna have to put the, put the blood in my mouth and I'm gonna have to spit it on your face out of camera. <laughs> but the tension level. And maybe it was just because we were all so in character and we were about to do something so ghastly. Well, I had to hit um, Charlie Getz with the butt of a handgun like 15 times over, so that's a very grisly thing to do, just acting it. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like for real um, to actually just bash somebody's head in that way. It just sends chills up my spine. 
the lady who played my wife, uh, a young actress named Cherise Parvis Burke. Uh, I don't think she really quite understood what she was getting into when she accepted this role. And I still can't believe the actress playing um, the LaBianco wife did this, but it was when Tex takes up her skirt and I actually am stabbing her butt. And that they thought they were gonna have to do a prosthetic because they didn't think they, the actress would do it. And she laid there and took it and that was a very um, hard thing, you know, as any, as an actor, as a person just to, to do because it, it happened. I, I don't think she was overly thrilled, no. But she was still a trooper and, and she did what had to be done. Definitely, I remember feeling a little bit weird for a few days. Like, that was a little creepy, so, yeah. <laughs> the girl who played Sharon Tate, she was, oh, it was, it was almost heartbreaking, you know, because she had on the, the big belly, and she was she did a really good job herself, and she's so beautiful. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to kill you anyhow. Look, bitch, I don't give a shit about you. I don't care if you're going to have a baby. You better be ready, because you're going to die, and I don't feel a thing about it. It wasn't creepy in any sort of way until they actually set action. And then it was horrifying. And just listening to Tina scream, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through because it sounded for all the world like it was completely real. The murder of Sharon Tate. That's what everybody knows, and that's what everybody fixates upon. That's why we know this case, because a Hollywood starlet who was married to a very famous film director was killed. If she had not been involved, I doubt that we would even know about this case now in 2004. To me, she is a human being just like Gary Hinman, just like Bernard Crow, just like Donald Shea, and so many other people who were slaughtered, and she's no more important or less important. And I had seen the glorification and the zeroing in on that she's so important, and she's not. I mean, in that respect, I mean, her life is deadly important, as all of our lives are. I deliberately did not show her death in graphic detail like I did the rest. Jim just really had no interest in, in showing a pregnant woman getting stabbed in the belly. He, as violent as the film is and as gruesome as the film is, um, he was willing to try to make the point about the violence of the actual incidents without going to that point. And I deeply respect her husband, Rome Plansky, you know, who's suffered his entire life, who's a genius filmmaker, who's, as far as I can tell, a beautiful human being. And, um, I, you know, I felt guilty even taking on the subject matter because I love Roman's film so much. And um, I wanted to make the audience suffer through what it's like being there through other people so they don't get caught up in this Hollywood starlet thing. And cut. Around the time of 1995, I had a cut that was, um, I don't know, about 115 minutes. And one of my most trusted friends, and one of the people that I believe understands film, is Mike Capone. When the film came to me, it was in a non-linear structure. It actually began with a bit of the LaBianca murders, and he said, Jim, nobody's going to understand this. You would, what the hell are you doing? You start the movie with the LaBianca murders? I mean, look, people don't know this, you know, and they're not going to get it. <laughs> I think we both agreed that the Manson myth had needed some deflating, and more than anything, this movie really presents a humanizing portrait of what has become a, a kind of a mythological experience that really doesn't have anything to do with the reality of the situation. The version that was sent to the festivals in 1997 is a basic 
representation of the cut that me and Mike Capone made. I think he was expecting the move to L.A. to maybe put a shot in the arm of getting it finished. And when it didn't, I think that really started to affect him. And he definitely, there was a lot of, I know he fell into a big depression. And uh, from what I understand, his behavior started becoming a lot more erratic. I mean, in many ways, when Jim moved to Los Angeles, it was just, it's kind of like a darker place. I saw Jim maybe get closer to the edge than maybe I would have liked to have seen him get through the years. But I can't say that faced with the same thing myself, the same thing wouldn't happen. I want to be the bad guy that you point your fucking finger at. Charlie's family became a total obsession for Jim and something he could not take his eye off of it. Mike worked as hard as he could, you know, for me, but Mike, you know, righteously so, took care of Mike, you know. Um, he made sure that he carved out a career as a shooter in Dayton, Ohio, and what could I carve a career out of? You know, I had this albatross that was half finished, and. Um, I had to, it was up to me to take care of that. The offers he did get, you know, were frightening or laughable. You know, it's like, you know, the people that did offer, you know, wanted to give nothing and take everything. And that wasn't, you know, and then they also wanted their cut and they just, they didn't want to give Jim what he wanted. And he wanted to make his movie. Many people have accused me of being incredibly bullheaded and stupid. And, uh, you know, unwilling to work with other people, which is not the case. It's just that this film was so important and so homegrown and reality based that I could not compromise. I just couldn't. He sunk his whole entire life and being into this and. I have a lot of respect for him with it. I know how hard it was on him. And, you know, a committed filmmaker is, is, uh, is sometimes a scary thing to watch. That's Jim, though. I mean, when you sign on board the Van Bever boat, dude, that's what you get. He is truly an insane genius. And it's, it's fortunate for us that he chose movie making rather than murder as a way to express himself. Jim might be the only true artist that I've ever met. I mean, can you imagine what it takes to pursue a dream at the cost of everything? I mean, everybody from a vantage point of success says, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. But when your dreams lead you over a cliff, there may come a time where maybe you should stop following your dreams. Well, Jim stuck with this thing for 15 years. In the meantime, thank God, I had met Philip Anselmo, who, um, in a strange way, briefly took me under his wing by uh, throwing me jobs, you know, that, you know, allowed me to pay the rent. I tried to um, birth the toolbox murders at that point. You know, me and David Shulkin launched that film, and then it got taken over by Toby Hooper. But I mean, I was always trying to do something and not willing to give up the Manson family. Every time I talked to any of those guys, I'd say, hey, what's up with Charlie? And they would always be, oh, nothing really. Okay. And then it just kept going for years. And finally, hey, these guys from England are going to take the movie and they're going to finish it. When David Gregory and Carl Daff finally came on and came to the rescue of the film, I was 50% flabbergasted and 50% scared to death. I felt an extra sense of uh, protection. Um, I felt like at this point, it wasn't just a film, it was my daughter. And um, 
I demanded to have my cut and demanded to have a 5.1 and I remember implicitly telling David when it came time for me to make the sound logs which are very intense and involved I said I want to write a symphony and he let me do it and he gave me the time and uh, I'm forever grateful cheers my brother sad zone goes uh, right up to the end of Clem you're at the now and then, that, then it just cuts fit quick fade quick fade on you're at the now and when you're that aware you're at the now the first time that I really took it in is my whole vision after all these years you know the ultimate finally uh, coughing up the hairball that was in the sound mix use fear to help you exist and to live in the now Yay! That's the Charlie's Family Sound Mix. I'm a Charlie fan and a Van Bever fan, so it's... Awesome, so you've been waiting. Then. I've been waiting patiently for 10 years. Yeah, the character's supposed to be the best movie ever. The best movie ever? Yep, we drove seven hours to see it. You drove seven hours? Yep, West Virginia. Bittersweet. <laughs> I don't have Jim Bam ever calling me up on the phone saying we have a shoot today, so that's a, that's a sweet thing. Bitter that it's over, and I don't know what we're going to do now. So. Just after seeing the final product, there's so much of it, just the sound, the animal noises, the music, it, it, it all came together. The vision was finally there. It was, it was, it was breathtaking. Um, it was emotional. I was awed. I, I was awed. It was a hundred times the movie I expected. I was really overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by it. I was, I cried. I was amazed, quite frankly. I was amazed that it was, it was, it's brilliant. It surpassed expectations. When the Manson family came out in England, I really thought that people would have been more responsive to what I was trying to do. Um, it hurt a little bit. <laughs> But, um, you know, when I was there, it didn't feel campy to me. I was never able to figure out why people didn't think this was, you know, some brilliant piece of, you know, underground, experimental, you know, haven't seen it before kind of cinema. People in England don't know much about Charlie. It's not an English legend. No, because all you English people are stodgy bastards. vulgar my god but it is this is reality i mean you don't want to talk about what abigail folger went through you know i mean what it, how would he have liked it you know how would have he accepted it you, you what he you know you want some romanticized version he doesn't want to see it just hear it or something is the film too violent, too gratuitous in its use of sex and nudity? For the subject matter, I don't think so. To depict something that was that horrible, you have to show some horrible stuff. And I really thought he showed great restraint. The Hollywood makes, makes violence approachable. This movie makes violence raw and real and something to be afraid of. I'm dealing with reality. And so it sparks reality within all of our own brains. People are going to react very diversively. You see a lot of films about mass murderers, and there are some other good ones out there. But I think Jim's is the first that truly captures both accurately uh, at a uh, sort of a level of realism, as well as morally at a visceral level, the, the impact of those events. It's America's problem. You know, so why should another country really care about it? 
That's why I think um, America will respond to this film, but the rest of the world probably, you know, is sick of us, you know? You know what? Who cares? You know, I, what Jim, Jim accomplished something, you know, it, it's done, it's made, it's, it's on the big screen. And if you didn't like it, too bad. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> I'm happy that it's exactly what it is. I really am. I'm thrilled to be a part of it because it's a classic. It's a gem. This is that 15 minutes, you know? <laughs> and you know what? If I lose my job as a school teacher because of it, that's their loss. I'm already glad to put this film behind me. Things done, it got done the way it needed to be done. I've already left it. I'm so out of Charlie's mindset, so far gone, he's so far off my radar. Nah, catch me if you can. Funny, I can't really understand why people are always saying the same thing. They're always, they're always, they're acting like this has some kind of, you know, long-term impact. 